For those of you that watch on a regular basis, you may be thinking, wonder where he is. Well, I'm in the same place, but behind me, you can see Robinson and Gosha and uh, Sable and Yashua, and they're waving at you right now. And you can't see the other people, but <clears throat> we have we shifted folks today somewhat, and I'm shifted. And, you know, we could have moved people a little bit different. We have people that are out of town today. And, and you know, I don't know how it is with you at your church, but even though we're in a house, we're still a church. And, uh, and the last thing that you can do is ask anybody to move from their seat because you get set into the thing where you sit in the same place. And today I would be speaking to a wall because the people that normally sit to my left are not here. And so uh, I decided I'd rather look at eyeballs. And uh, I don't know if you know who Miss Bertha Smith is, but she was a, a great lady and she was involved with the great Shantung revival. And, and if you've never read about that, the Shang, Shantung province of China, that was a great modern revival that took place in China many, many years ago. And Miss Bertha, she had piercing blue eyes. And she didn't, she didn't think women ought to preach, but we decided that she came dangerously close. And uh, Miss Bertha was really, really a special, special lady. And she said, even though I don't preach, quote unquote, she said, I like to teach to the eyes. She liked to look at people. And if I were here, I would be looking at you. So uh, I want to look at some eyes. And I'm really grateful for all the people that are here. I'm grateful for Robinson. He was able to share this morning. I'm looking at him on my left. And he was able to share this morning in churches. And, and God is using them in a in a way that, that I've never seen the like of, to tell you the truth. Uh, what's going on in Pakistan is beyond compare. And when you start talking about an entire people group that God is reaching with this message of the gospel of grace, the gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, grace, Jesus. His name is Jesus. Grace has a name. And uh, they have some needs over there financially. We need a vehicle. I want to tell you that. And if anybody would feel led to uh, help in that matter, that would be something that would really be a help. And uh, anyway, just wanted to throw that out. Robinson was praying this morning. He says, Lord, you know the needs. You've got it taken care of. And I really am grateful for that attitude from my brother. And he does. Same thing with you. Same thing with you. Well, folks, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. This is the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, kind of the beginning, traditional beginning of the Christmas season. Now, we don't know when Jesus was born. We don't know. We know that it probably was not December 25th. We know that much, but it really doesn't matter because we celebrate the, the life and the, and the birth of Jesus on a regular basis, just like we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection, not just at Easter, Easter but year-round. Well, Today we're going to be looking at the reason Jesus came. Last week we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 1 through 10. And in verse 2 it says that we talked about the acceptable time. He hears and he saves. He helps at the acceptable time. And he says, behold, now is the acceptable time. And we're going to be looking at that today, what Jesus said that was Paul talking last week. But today we're going to be looking at what Jesus said. We're going to see the reason that Jesus came or the ministry of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, in the first few verses, the first 13 verses, we see the temptation of Christ. He was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. He was tempted in every way that you're tempted, and the Bible says, yet without sin. He never sinned. You say, well, I want to not sin. Well, good news is sin is not an issue in your life anymore. You say, now, wait a minute. I know sin is an issue. No, because the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, here's the, here's the way some people think. They think of themselves as sinners that are trying to get by, that are trying to make it, and their mindset is on sin rather than understanding that their true identity is one of righteousness. And you think about the righteousness that is yours based on what he did, and it deals with sin. As long as you're trying to deal with sin, you never will. Sin will always be in the forefront. When you understand that is not your identity, that's when sin ceases to have mastery 
over you. Well, down in verse 14 in Luke chapter 4, I'm just going to read some verses, then we're going to talk about them. And we're going to see some things that to me are huge. And we're just going to talk about these things. Now, as I said before, Jesus had just come from the temptation of the devil in the wilderness. And he answered the devil every time he answered him with scripture. Now, I want to say this. This morning when we were praying, I was praying, Lord, I want to hear from the word. Now, understand. The Word is a person. His name is Jesus. Now, the Scriptures, we refer to them as the Word, but the Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We're talking about a person, Jesus. Does that mean the Scriptures aren't real? Nope. Does that mean the Scriptures are not, are not inspired? Nope. Does that mean the Scriptures are not correct? Nope. Doesn't mean that. All of those things are not true. The Scriptures are inspired. Every word. They are correct. Every word. There are some people that think that parts of them are not. Some of you may think that. And I'm going to say, how do you know who appointed you to be able to spot what was right and what was wrong in the scriptures? The problem is not that they're not right or wrong. The problem sometimes I just don't understand. And we have this thing. If we don't understand it, it can't be right about whatever it is. Well, that's not right. I want to tell you that. Verse 14 and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Let me stop and say this. Everything that Jesus did, He did in the power of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. The Spirit did all that, that it looked like Jesus was doing on this earth. Every bit of that was through the power of the Holy Spirit. He did exactly what He did, the same way you do, the same way I do, the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, He returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about Him spread through all the surrounding district. Jesus, his ministry hadn't been going on for a long time now, but the word was spreading pretty quick. Galilee. That's in the northern part of Israel. And it's up close to where he lived in Galilee. And verse 15, it says, And he began teaching in their synagogues. Well, began is not in the Greek. It just says, and he teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Why do we not need the word began? Because this was who he is. Not just who he was. This was his identity. This is what he did wherever he was. When he was walking with his disciples, this is what he did. He was a teacher. You teach. I teach. You mamas. I'll guarantee you, you're teachers. Everything you do. You say, well, I didn't homeschool. That's the thing now. I didn't homeschool. We, we homeschool. But you're teaching all the time, and so are you dads. This is what we do. And in teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Now, I have a thing here. What changed? What changed? He was being praised by all in the beginning, and we're going to see that that changed pretty quickly. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The church or the synagogue that Jesus grew up in, I have actually been in that synagogue. I'm sure there have been some repairs uh, to that synagogue. It's still there. It's amazing. In our country, we, we have such a short history. But you go to Europe, and that's a, it's a pretty long history there. And you go to Israel, even longer. And you can still go to the synagogue of Jesus' youth in Nazareth. It's still there. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Now, I want to say this. All customs aren't bad. Today, people say if it's the custom, then we've got to throw it out. That's not true. There's some customs that are really good. And he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. This was the custom too. Somebody would come in and different ones would stand to read. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 61, beginning in verse 1, this is what he was reading. He was reading Old Testament. Some people might say he was reading Old Covenant. But no, this is not Old Covenant. This is actually the covenant, the covenant of grace, which preexisted the covenant of law. So let's read what he was reading here. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Now here's what he's going to here's what he's going to read. He's going to read this message of release, 
and he's going to read a message of anointing. Here we go. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. And the spirit of the Lord, Lord is upon me. Now, there's no is in this verse. In the, in the Greek, there's no is here. There's no verb at all. And the spirit of the Lord upon me. What he's doing here, he's stating a fact. It's not like the spirit would come, the spirit would go. The spirit of the Lord upon me. That's what this is saying. Upon me because he anointed me. Now this word anointed, this is an aorist tense verb. Now what does that mean? It means it was a finished thing. Finished, completed action. Can't be done again. He was anointed. Now are you ready for this? So are you. Who anointed him? The Spirit of the Lord. Who has anointed you? The Spirit of the Lord. Here's the difference. He knew it. Many don't. The Spirit of the Lord anointed me, now I like this, to preach. And this word preach, it literally, it can be translated proclaim. In fact, it is translated proclaim in some other places. There, there are three different words for the word preach. One of them is the word that we use for standing in a pulpit or, or in front of people and you're proclaiming in a group. That's one of them. And Jesus did that. There's another one. It means to gossip, literally, to gossip the gospel. And Jesus did that. As he was going, he was gossiping the gospel. And we're going to see this. But to preach, present tense, present infinitive, that means as a continual action. He anointed me, completed action, to preach as I am going continually the gospel to the poor. Now, the gospel. This literally means to preach the gospel. It means to bring the good news, the gospel. Paul called it the good news. Paul said it was the death and the burial and the resurrection. Now, Jesus is going to be preaching the death, burial, and the resurrection. That has not come yet. The cross had not happened concerning Jesus at this time. He had not been crucified. He had not been uh, scourged. He had not done all the things that he was going to do, but in eternity, it was finished. So Jesus is preaching right here, beginning the gospel, the good news, the good news, the completed work of what he'd already completed in eternity that hadn't taken place in time. He had completed and preaching this gospel to the poor. And let me tell you what this means, this word poor, it means of no wealth and no influence. These people that he's preaching to are the ones that saw themselves as the ones without influence and without wealth. When I go to Pakistan, been to Pakistan, you see a lot of poor people there. And truly poor by our standards here. But by the standards of other places that I go, the people in Pakistan are not really poor. Because in some places that I go, Haiti, you've been there, those are some poor people. The goal of a person in Haiti is to eat something today. If he's a father, his goal is to feed his children something today. The per capita income in Haiti is less than $200 a year. $200 a year. Try feeding your family on $200 a year. You say, well, things cost less there than they do here. No, they cost more than they do here. You say, how do they make it? Many of them don't, and I don't understand how they make it. But those poor, they're the ones that are without wealth and without influence. You know what? Sometimes I see that it's much easier to preach this gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of grace to those that know they are in need than it is to preach to those that think they have no needs. So he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Then he says, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. I'm going to sh share with you a couple things. He was anointed to preach, and we're going to see that he was sent to proclaim and to set free, and he, to proclaim release and recovery, and to set free the downtrodden, and then proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This word sent... This is the same word 
that was used. Do you remember the story when, uh, when Jesus went to the guy and he made some, he was blind and he, and he made some mud and he put it in his eyes and he said, go and wash in this particular pool. And then when he did, he could see. And, 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 the, and the name of the pool, when you translate it, was, was sent. Do you know that before and after in that place in Scripture, Jesus was, was referring to himself as the sent one, the sent one. And you go to the sent one and you are washed and you see. The problem is not that there are not great miracles going on. The problem is not that the gospel has not been fulfilled. The problem is that people don't see it. In the U.S. with English, we have this saying, do you see what I'm talking about? What we're saying, do you understand? And what we say, do you see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? They don't see. They don't see the sent one. They don't know. Jesus is the sent one. He was sent by the Holy Spirit to proclaim relief to the captives. To proclaim release. You know what this word release means? It doesn't just mean set free. It means to pardon or to forgive. To forgive and give pardon to the captives. Now, he's saying here, that pardon has been given, forgiveness has been given. This is aorist tense. It is completed action. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. I have a question here. <clears throat> Who's done anything at this point? Has any man done anything? These people hadn't even believed yet. He's saying this is so before they did anything. Do they believe it? I hope so. Many did. Some didn't. Do they need to believe it? Yes, they do. I was talking today about the fact that when we were <coughs> broke, we've been broke many times, but we were really broke. We were broke with no expect expectations of any money coming in. And my wife was figuring the checkbook, and we figured it very closely in those days, and, and found out that we were $500 off in the checkbook. $500 off. Said we had 500 more than we did. A round number thought, well, we must have made a mistake. How could we have that? extra money. And 500 doesn't sound like so much sometimes. But let me tell you, it sounds a lot to me. But in that day with four kids and no job that was paying anything, it sounded like a whole lot. So I went down and checked with the bank after we'd done all we could and find out, sure enough, we had $500 extra in there. And so we thought, of course, there must have been a mistake. And then the bank assured us, and they knew things we didn't know at that time, that there was no mistake. We, in truth, did have $500 more than we thought we did. Well, that seemed like a huge amount of money. And so finally, we spent what was in our checking book that we didn't believe it was truly ours even before we knew it. And we benefited from it as we began to believe, okay, they say it's ours. I'm going to believe them. And so we spent it. It could have stayed in there. We would have had that money in the checkbook and we would not have benefited anything from it if we had not believed it. And that's exactly the way it is with Christ. You have been forgiven. You have been set free. You were a captive to sin and death. And you are no longer a captive of sin and death. You have been forgiven. You have been pardoned. And we're going to see in a few minutes here that you have been set free. Okay. Release forgiveness to the captives. And then he says, and recovery of sight to the blind. The sent one is recovering the sight of the blind. And then he said to set free those who are downtrodden. Boy, I like that. Set free. Again, completed action. Finished. The set free those who are downtrodden. Do you realize that the downtrodden, this is not just someone, quote unquote, who's a sinner. This is someone who has been beat down by the law. See, the law tells you all your shortcomings, all your failures, and granted, every one of them that they're telling you are true. And then the law goes on to say, and men even add things to the law, that the way you come out from under that downtroddenness is to do better, change, stop something, and start something. 
And I can tell you right now, if that's what you believe, and if that's how you act, then you will live in total defeat for all your life. It won't be true, but you'll live there as if it is true. To set free once and for all those who are downtrodden. And then it says to proclaim. And that's basically the same word as preach. To proclaim once and for all completed action, the favorable year of the Lord. You know what this word favorable means? It means acceptable. Last week, I shared with you when, when it was saying, and it was, I believe, Jesus' sentiment as Paul was sharing it. He said, behold, now is the acceptable time. And behold, now is the day of salvation. It's acceptable for you now. And the day of salvation is for you now. The acceptable time, this is the acceptable time. And you say, okay, it's the acceptable time because Jesus is sharing it. Folks, this was written by Isaiah long before Jesus was born. So this was true when Isaiah wrote it. But wait a minute. This was true before Isaiah wrote it. Isaiah didn't write it so that it would be true. Isaiah wrote what was true. Folks, this was true in the garden. It was the acceptable time in the garden. Jesus showed us, and that was Jesus, Yahweh, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus said that. When he restored the relationship with man who had sinned by making a covering for his sin, the shedding of innocent blood. Well, it's the acceptable time in the year, the favorable year of our Lord. He is showing you that this is the acceptable time, the year of our Lord. You are greatly favored. And then something happened that's really, really amazing. And we're not going to go long today. After Jesus finished, he said this, to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. And then in verse 20, and he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. Now it's interesting. He closed the book. Folks, the book has been closed. It is finished. There's nothing else to do. Jesus was telling all the stuff that was going to happen, but he was telling it as if it were finished. Why? Because it is. Because in eternity it's finished. He closed the books. And then he did what it talks about in the book of Hebrews. He sat down. Later the author of the Hebrews writes that. And he sat down. Do you know why he sat down? Because there's nothing else to do. Folks, this is the good news. There was nothing else to do before anything was done. Because in eternity, it was all finished. There was nothing else to do, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Verse 21, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now folks, this was a really big deal. Today, this scripture, they knew this scripture, the book of Isaiah, is fulfilled in your hearing. <clears throat> I got a question for you. If it was fulfilled in that day, forgiveness, pardon to the poor, those that see it, and people had their eyes opened. They began to see. He gave sight to the blind. If it was fulfilled in that day, here's my question. Is it fulfilled today? Was it fulfilled for these people that were hearing it before their sight was restored? Was it? It was. Did they know it once their sight was restored? Did they know they'd been pardoned? Did they know they'd been forgiven when their sight was restored? Yes, they did. Did they know it before their sight was restored? No, they didn't. And it's the same way today. We share these truths with people of forgiveness and restoration that Christ has done before we know about it. We tell them about it. Then God opens their eyes and they see it. Will they benefit from it if they don't believe it? No. Is it still true? Yes. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Verse 22. 
I'm going to show you how some things changed quickly. And all were speaking well of him. And were wondering at the, grace, at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. Now, what kind of words fall from grace? Gracious words fall from grace. Grace, that's a name. Jesus. And then they were saying, and they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. They wanted to see some miracles. All of a sudden, it became not about what was done, but what needed to be done. Not about what was already done. Jesus said it's finished. It's completed today. It's completed here. Then they say, okay, now show us something. Do something. And that's exactly where we are today. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. We see that today. It's really funny where I live. Uh, good people, lovely people. People come up to me and they ask me this question. I get asked quite often, are you still preaching? And I kind of chuckle. I say, yeah, I preach some. Really? Where? They're thinking, well, you don't have a church on the corner anymore. I said, well, I travel a little bit. Get to preach a little bit in other places. Where? Uh, well, I've been on four continents preaching the gospel of grace, which there is no other gospel. But Jesus said, but I say to you, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Verse 25. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, three and a half years, when a great famine came over all the land. Now we're going to see that all were not fed. I don't understand this, but Jesus is making a point here. You're going to see this. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a, to a woman who was a widow. He went to one person. And there were many lepers in the land of Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. I've got a message on that. One day I'm going to preach it. I don't think I've ever preached it for you. Of Naaman the leper. Now he said there were all these hungry people, but Elijah went to one person. I don't understand this. And all these people with leprosy, but Elisha... Uh, healed one person. I'm sure there were more healed, but for this illustration, verse 28. Now, look what happened. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. Now, before, they were, uh, they were amazed, speaking well of him, of these gracious words that were falling from his lips. And you know what they're hearing now? They're, he's saying to me, that maybe I don't understand what he's talking about. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I have not believed what he said. I don't know. But the Bible says they were filled with rage. And they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Many times people meant to kill Jesus and it was like he would just walk out of their midst because it wasn't his time. Well, in this case, they did not believe. Now, folks, here's where I'm going with this, and then we're done. There are people today that get very angry when you tell them that this is done for all people and that it is finished. They don't know it. They need to believe it. They need to receive it. What's been theirs already, what's been given, they don't know it. And for some reason, some will not believe. But when I tell folks that it has been given to them anyway, even though they don't know it, even though, they're, even though they're not benefiting from it, even though they're rejecting Christ, and they won't benefit in eternity from their perspective either without believing. But when I tell people this is finished, period, people get mad. People get angry. Now that's crazy. Is that not crazy? Because none of us deserve it. The favorable year of the Lord. Release to the captives. Who's been held captive by sin? All men. Who's been released? All men. Who's gained pardon and forgiveness? All men. 
completed action, errors tense, can't be done again. It was done one time. And you know what? We see it the first time when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, errors tense. He said it from the cross, for they know not what they do. But I'm telling you, that's not when it happened. It happened in eternity. Before any of us were ever born, before anything was created, before even He chose you in Him, it was already completed. Because God is a God of eternity. He is the eternal God. And it was finished before it began. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. There is no change in Jesus. He's the God who not only loves, but He's the God who is love by nature. God is love. And it's finished. And He's telling them before it happened what was going to happen. And it was told by Isaiah. This is one of the ways that we know that Jesus is the God-man. Because Isaiah preached this first. And Jesus came and He said, I am the one Isaiah was talking about. I'm the one you've been looking for. I am the Messiah. He claimed to be God because He is God. And then He told us what was finished from His perspective. Now, it's not finished from your perspective if you hadn't believed it. But it's finished from God's perspective. Well, this is the first in the series of some little Christmas things that I'm going to be doing. And I hope this benefited you. I know it benefited me. And so, uh, Merry Christmas. I'll be saying it for a while. And we'll see you next time.